powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Eagles continuing to put together their roster and a lot of NFL news and notes as we look around the football landscape at 4 o'clock. Jeff Mosher on a Mosher Monday for Football at Four from InsideTheBirds.com and Inside the Birds podcast. The boys in the house all week long, leading you up to the draft. Mike and Ryan here at the Gallery Bar Book and Games inside Ocean Casino Resort. And don't forget, we've got the final four this weekend right here on 97.3 ESPN. You can check out all the final four action inside the Gallery Bar Book and Games. But right now, we bring in Jeff Mosher to talk a little birds, to talk a little football on a Monday edition of football at four. Bosch, what's up, brother? I would rather talk about the Final Four because, you know, I'm a big UConn Huskies fan, baby. Now, did you have UConn? Did you have UConn in your bracket? I didn't say I was insane, Mike. I just said I'm a UConn Huskies fan. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it wouldn't be. They were a four seed. I mean, it wasn't crazy to think they could make it. Come on, man. You had no faith? That's true. Uh, Wait, no, why are you a I, UConn I, I Husky fan? To, I did have him going to the eight. I thought he went to, I I went to the eight. He's from Connecticut. Oh. He said, well, no, I said he went there, but you went to Penn State. You're from Connecticut. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Correct. I grew up a UConn Huskies fan. I go back yeah. to Tate George, baby. There you go. <laughs> Tate George. I'm, we were talking about this earlier about – is this good for college basketball that these are the four teams? I said, you know, college basketball is kind of a niche sport. They need the Blue Bloods. They need the brand names in there. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, um, the FAU, uh, who is it? FAU Miami, is that the game? Or no, no, FAU. No, they're playing San Diego State. Right. That one may not be a great rating straw as compared to what it would have been if it were the one versus two or a Duke or North Carolina. I agree with you. I think people like the upsets early, but then they like to settle into the blue bloods by the time you get to the Elite Eight and Final Four. So I think that it's probably not great for, for the sport. Uh, I want to get your thoughts, Jeff Mosher. The Eagles uh, made a couple of moves, uh, obviously, late in the week when you were not on. Uh, get your thoughts on the Terrell Edmonds move. Uh, they signed him. Looks like a very good deal for them. Lot Low money. Uh, but how will he fit into this defense? Yeah, that's a great question because Terrell Edmonds has been, and by the way, it's sort of a fascinating case study into like free agency and what teams want because here's a guy who was a five-year starter, one of the most experienced safeties on the market and he has to sign a one-year deal with for now a lot of money whereas in a deep safety i mean donovan wilson and von bell and marcus epps doesn't even have nearly as many starts as terrell edmonds so i don't know if it's that the reputation of terrell is that he's kind of maxed out as to who he is i don't know if you're going to get anything better than what you've gotten from him from his first five years which is mainly a a box safety who never really lived up to being a first round pick, not a bad player, but just sort of an okay player at his position and how he fits in the Eagles defense is sort of an interesting question because assuming they still play a variation of the Vic Fangio style concepts where you're playing a lot of quarters, you're playing a lot of split safeties. He's not really been that kind of guy. He is not a deep safety. He's not a split safety guy. He's a box safety, a physical guy. So um, I think, though, that Howie Roseman looks at his roster and says, you know what, I need guys that I know can at least play in the NFL. And right now, at safety, before signing Edmonds, I got Justin Evans, who who missed three years of football, and is a nice player, and we hope he does well, but you can't depend on. And Reed Blankenship, who is a rookie free agent who did nicely, but again, is he a starter? I think that's a big question. And Kayvon Wallace, who hasn't proven to be a starter in a couple years, and Andre Shashere is a special teamer. So for the money that he's paying, uh, I think how he's basically, his philosophy was at least get me a guy who I know can play NFL football at that position. And if I'm able to do better for the rest of the offseason, either in a trade or a draft or whatever, then I can do better and give myself that freedom. But right now I just need guys that can play at that position. Yeah, and I guess the follow-up question to this would be, Does this give you any insight to their thought process with Reed Blankenship? Do you look like, hey, this is a good pairing for Blankenship, or, hey, these guys are not the type of players that they want to play together, and that would indicate maybe they're looking for another safety? 
No, I really don't. I mean, obviously, if Reed Blankenship, if they thought he was Brian Dawkins, right, then, then maybe they would approach it differently. But I don't think anybody thinks that. So, and I don't think them not thinking that is like an indictment on on Reed Blankenship. He just is what he is. And listen, they need two safeties. They lost both their starters. So there's no, nothing that says that Edmonds and Reed Blankenship can't be their safeties when the season begins. But uh, again, I think that they're looking for to diversify what they have at that position, and they need to have guys who can play and have seen it all. And Edmonds in the AFC North against uh, all those teams and for five years being a starter has at least seen it all. So even if he's not great at, or even very good at any one thing, he at least can go out there and give you formidable play at that position, you would, you would imagine. Yeah, the Eagles have made a lot of moves uh, in the past couple of weeks here, most shot really past week, whatever it is. But where's the priority, right? If you had the depth chart in front of you right now, because I look at safety, uh, and I say, okay, you know, some, some nice moves, but I'm not thrilled about it like, as, as it stands on the depth chart right now. I would still like to see how he do some more work. Um, I believe he will, but how do you assess it all up to this point? Yeah, Ryan, good question. I mean, I would think it has to be interior defensive line where there's no more – right now, for the moment, there's no Linville Joseph, there's no – uh, Damakang Su, there's no Javon Hargrave, right? And there's a Jordan Davis who is coming off, you know, you, you can call it a disappointing rookie season, you can call it unfulfilling, whatever you want. It's just, he didn't see enough. And it's not exactly like he can sit here today and be confident he can play 40 to 50 snaps uh, when the season comes along. Now, maybe he can. Uh, they hope he can, but right sitting here today, they can't. But even if he could, who's the starter next to him? Is it Milton Williams? Is it Fletcher Cox and Milton Williams starting with, with Jordan Davis? I think that that looks a lot different from what they had last year and what they've had in years past. Milton's a rotational guy so far, short-armed kind of guy, which is a reason why with all that burst that he has, he's not like he was a first or a second-round pick. I don't know that they view him as an every-down type of defensive tackle. So clearly the in- interior of this defensive line has to be addressed, and since they're still – kind of small at linebacker with the Kobe Dean and Morrow and still small at the middle of safety, you know, stopping that run is going to be a big concern uh, along with rushing the passer. He lost a lot of sacks with Javon Hargrave there, but really just everything that the interior of a defense gives you, they're lacking at the moment. So is that the, the priority come draft day for their first round decisions? And in part two, who on the draft board would need to fall to the Eagles for Howie to say, rerouting we're actually going to go here because he's the best available that I really like. Um, if that makes well, sense. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I suppose if Will Anderson, right, a defensive end, yeah. an edge guy who's there at 10 for whatever reason, then you just take Will Anderson and say, I'll figure out mm-hmm. what I need elsewhere. Um, but I, I really think when you look at what their, not only their needs right now, but even for young replenishment and young prospects you look at defensive line interior line and you look at cornerback i'm not saying they couldn't take an offensive lineman but i really think that the way this draft when you look at the top 10 15 prospects and and where they really are deficient not just for now but in the future those are the two positions that kind of jump out at me d tackle cornerback yeah and and you know obviously um, I shouldn't say safety, by the way, but you, we all know that they don't take safety. <laughs> right, that's true. Um, but, well, the only thing apparently they do take are linemen, although they have taken wide receivers in the last couple of first rounds. But that being said, when you see a story like what's going on in Tennessee and those type of stories, obviously we always have to keep our eye on Philadelphia. But we had McMullen on earlier, and mm-hmm. his message kind of was, you know, like Jeffrey Simmons, by the way, you know, he's a very good defensive tackle. But part of the reason you could make the deals in the past is you could trade for A.J. Brown and then sign him to the big deal. With having to sign Jalen Hurts, that type of trade doesn't seem like it's a possibility. It is a little bit tougher. There's no doubt about it. Now, if you aren't able to get a player like Jeffrey Simmons, you have a year. I guess that would be – you would get a – He's, he's been in the league for, what, four years already? So, or three years, I mean? This would be his fourth year coming up? I'd have to look that up. I don't want to give it off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, I think you would have – you would probably have a year or two of control of him before you maybe had to pay him, just like same thing with A.J. Brown. But you would want to 
give him an extension. I, I still think you can make it happen. It's difficult. You may have to maneuver. Um, you may have to backload the contract a little bit because you don't have as much money this year. But for an elite player, Howie Roseman can and will oftentimes make it happen and just get creative with the, the contract structure. But here's the thing, like, you know, first of all, you're not getting Jeffrey Simmons. If people are thinking that you're getting him like you got T.J. Gardner-Johnson, you're crazy, right? You're, you're going to have to get him like you got Adrian Brown, which is probably giving up a first-round pick. Um, and then you only got five picks this year. So you kind of need to be judicious with how you're going to upgrade your team with such a few picks. And if you start trading away some of your first-round picks, one of your two, then that gives you less maneuverability to maybe trade down um, and then add picks later on. But he is an elite player, so I'm not, you know, I wouldn't, I think that that would be a very good move for the Eagles if they could get him. There's been a lot of talk and just speculation on uh, social media and amongst fans, Moshe, with uh, B. John Robinson and Zeke. And I brought this up earlier. I wanted your thoughts, so here we go. B. John Robinson, if he somehow is able to become available or if Howie trades down, I look at that as a really good decision because now you get a, a, a great talent on a rookie contract and you have to be stealing him away from Jerry Jones and the Cowboys. I would imagine Jones has circled him in all of his highlighters. Uh, I would imagine. Well, we'll see. I mean, I mean, he is, he look, he's an elite prospect and you know, I don't know. I get the feedback that it was like maybe 11 or 12 guys in this draft that are considered truly, you know, first round elite prospects, mm-hmm. which is typical, usually anywhere 12 to 15. He's one of them. And I, I buy what their Daniel Jeremiah was selling last month saying that, you know, it's not really good team building when you're a bad team and you take a, a running back in the top 10 or 12. But if you're a really good team like the Eagles and you do it, you get five years of very economical elite play out of the running back position. He certainly helps you. And, um, you know, after you, you kind of get all the wear and tear on him then, and then after that, if you walk, you walk, but you got the, you got him in his prime and, and at a time that you needed him and really could use him. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose you can leave the door open for that idea that the Eagles could take B. John Robinson, probably not a 10, maybe if they were able to trade down uh, and acquire. And we do know that they would have taken Christian and McCaffrey several years in 2017 if he had fallen to them, but, and that he didn't. So we'll see on, on Bijan. I, I will never slam the door on it, but I will say it, it's probably highly, highly unlikely. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. We've kind of gone back and forth on him. I, I, I mean, but they're at 10. And the question we've kind of said is, okay, let's say they like Bijan Robinson. He would have to be best player available at some point on their board, right, Motion? You're a big best player available proponent if memory yep. serves. So yes. best player available – at what point, like if he's the best player available at 10, do they say he's best player available? We take him. That question, uh, he did not like that. So much he hung up on. He me. did not enjoy that question <laughs> at all. I mean, that was a come on, man. That was a mic drop. And, and here, this is why I expect his answer to be, and I don't know, <laughs> but if they're at 10 and Bajon Robinson's on the board, I would imagine there's a good chance they could try to trade out. The question becomes, yeah, do they like Bajon Robinson enough to trade back? Where do they have to trade back to to say we still have a shot to get him? Is it 15? Is it 18? Is it 19? Is it 20? Yeah. I mean, I've. But McMullen said earlier, he doesn't even think that if he was there at 30, they would take him because I of the not wanting to pay the fifth year. But this is how I look, Howie, do, look at it for Howie to possibly do it. He does a Howie swindle deal, a fleecing, where he trades out a 10, he gets an additional late round pick, right? Like, what if he trades down to 24, let's say? Gets a, a third-round pick. So he adds another pick. He steals Bijan away from Dallas and adds Bijan Robinson. That's how I see them pulling it off. Yeah, all right. Moshe is back. I said, you were so turned off <laughs> by me asking you about a running back at 10 that you hung up on me. It was, uh, I was just trying to leave you guys in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. So, okay, best player available. He's on the board at 10. I would imagine they try to trade back, no? Uh, I would imagine so, yeah. I would imagine so. I mean, mm-hmm. and then again, if someone wanted to trade up to 10 for a running back, that would be remain to be seen. Now, McMullen said earlier he doesn't even think if they had 
if he was on the board at 30, he didn't doesn't think they would take him. Uh, I don't know about that. Well, the you know, reason again, he they gave extreme. the reason he gave is the fifth year that they don't want to pay that fifth year because the running back goes from that gets a big bump in pay in that fifth year. Well, they don't have to pick up the fifth year option. They can just let him become a free agent after four. If they didn't want, you know, I mean, again, like you're, you're really trying to get this guy for the first four to five years of his career. And if the fifth one is too expensive for you because he's a running back, Mm -hmm. then just make it four. Now, now you can argue, do you use a first round pick on a guy who you're only expecting to have for four years? That, it's all fair. So that's why I say I don't see it as very likely or probable, but I just won't slam the door on it. I mean, if the guy was so special that he's one of these, like, runs the ball, catch the ball, gets you 20, like McCaffrey, 2,000, 2,200 yards, then you'd probably consider picking up the fifth-year option on a guy that good because he's probably helping you out in more than just one way. Probably if, sort of if, your semi-slot receiver at times. If Miles Sanders had a fifth-year option, would they have picked it up? Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but he also so. wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't worthy of it. No, I mean, that, that's my point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's I, no, helping just, them in a variety of different ways. I don't think any running back is, but that's a different combo. Right now, I guess a question would be: Well, I mean, you look at well, when you guys look at what Eckler, yeah. look yeah. at what Austin Eckler does for the Chargers, and look at what McCaffrey mostly did for the Panthers. Now he's on a better team, but I mean, Austin Eckler, you can make an argument he's a running back and a slot receiver with all the cat, like mm-hmm. Brian Westbrook was for the Eagles, and um, his, the production's there; it matches it. Yeah, he um, does everything for them. Well, and I guess the question might be: If Bajon Robinson's on the board at thirty. Would the Eagles then trade back and hope that they can possibly get him in the second round, much like they drafted Miles mm-hmm. Sanders? Uh, this is the craziest hypothetical. For I, I can't. If he's available at thirty, then I, I don't know what happened because yeah. I know he's a running back. But you know, okay. there are going to be a lot of teams in the second half of the first round who are pretty good and just say, "All right, I'll take this guy for five years." Well, it's funny <sighs> because we were just talking when you hung up on us so rudely. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> that, um, what's the line of demarcation of moving back? Is it 15? Is it 18? Is it 20? That you would say you need, you can move back to 20 and still have a shot to get him. That's a great question. Uh, I don't have the list of teams in front of me, but like, you know, if I, you got to look at the teams that like to run and prefer running backs, Washington is one. Um, Carolina, here you go. Here you go. Right there Most. now, maybe Most. not so much. Most, here you go. Eleven is Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Would they take a running back? Well, they're, if they're trying to unload Derrick Henry, and if they could and get another running back, yeah, maybe. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. Probably not. But Houston, hmm. doubt it. They drafted that kid last year. Um, the Jets. Yeah. No. The Jets are at 13. Uh, 14 is New England. No. Mm, doubt it. All right. The, the, the Packers. I mean, they got two good running backs. Yeah, I doubt it. I, yeah, I get what you're saying here. Washington's at 16. Now, you just mentioned them. Would they draft a running back at 16? A hundred percent. I mean, did you hear Ron Rivera after the year? They ran the ball 41 times in their season finale, I think. And he's like, this is what we want to be. And this is what we are. All right. Absolutely. So, so 16 may be that line. Cause the next pick is Pittsburgh. They've got Najee Harris 18. Um, I have, see. Yeah. I see Detroit, a lot of it. Sorry. Detroit is 18. They've got the, the chargers. The chargers. Uh, well, Tampa Bay's 19 chargers, Seattle's 21 20, oh, yeah. chargers are 21. Yeah, he ain't getting past 18, 19. I, I, I don't think so. Because somebody that will move up two spots if they need to to get him. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, I, and mocks are, you know, you, you take I them for them. what they're worth. I love a good mock. I, I love a mock. I love mocking in general. <laughs> but um, yeah, I see a lot of them where he's like 20, 22 to 30. Like, I don't see a lot of mock drafts where Bijan's in the top 15. I see a lot of mock drafts where he's 10. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go. I mean, it depends what you click on your Google search, I guess. But oh man, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Jeff Mosher, inside the birds. 
the podcast, and of course, InsideTheBirds.com and Football at Four every day right here on the Sports Bash Live 97.3 ESPN. Lamar Jackson requests a trade, by the way. And, uh, well, it looks like he'll be playing in a new spot. Maybe any interest in Lamar Jackson on draft day? I don't know that he's going to be playing in a new spot. I don't know what kind of leverage that he has. The Ravens have all the leverage in that. If he doesn't sign the franchise tender, then are you going to just sit out for a year and not make any money at all? Good. That's not exactly a great business decision. All right, brother, we'll talk to you Wednesday. See you guys. In the immortal words of Andy Reid after a win, we'll see you Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs>